Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Delivering Frictionless Digital and Mobile Support Experiences. I'd like to extend a thank you to every one of the over 700 of you who are joining us today. We're really excited to have all of you join our discussion. While we wait for those of you who are still trying to join the webinar, I will run through a brief introduction to our fantastic panelists that you can see on screen now and go over a few bits of housekeeping so that we can keep everything running smoothly. Myself, I'm Scott Cormack, the Global Event Director here at Reuters Events, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our exciting panel of mobile first leaders who are eager to dive into our discussion. We're lucky to have a, a whole host of new faces join us today, um, so I'll waste no time in introducing them to you. First up, um, we have a Reuters Events debut for Paul Tashima, the Chief Client Experience Officer over at Wealthsimple. We're really excited to bring his wealth of expertise to our panel today, and we're certain that he will add incredible value to this session. Next up, we have uh, Sarah Feldman, Head of Customer Care at Visible. Visible have been long-standing friends of ours here at Reuters Events, and we're really excited to have Sarah joining us on this panel today. In her two years at Visible, Sarah has developed and implemented a new customer care organization from the ground up, and we can't wait to hear more about it. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Matt Steen, VP of Products over at Metromile, uh, Metromile, for those of you who don't know, are a company that we're incredibly excited by, setting out to disrupt the auto insurance sector and taking it by storm. Uh, we're grateful to have Matt um, on, on the panel today and for taking the time to lend us his insights. Um, and then rounding out today's busy panel is Janice Lee, Chief Marketing Product Officer at today's sponsor, HelpShift. We're excited to be partnered with HelpShift on this fantastic webinar, and they've built the only mobile first customer service platform in a quest to rid the world of bad mobile and in-app customer service. So really looking forward to hearing more about that, Janice. Um, and finally, I'd like to welcome Nicholas Zeisler back from the ski slopes, and we're certainly grateful to have you return and keep this discussion on piste. Um, Nicholas is the principal of Zeisler Consulting and a former director of CX at HP. Um, and we are excited to continue to have his expertise feature throughout our webinars. Um, before we kick things off, I'd just like to highlight a quick piece of housekeeping, as I mentioned previously. Um, we've changed the Zoom platform for our webinars. Um, some of you will probably know that by now. Um, but yeah, we, we've developed a Zoom expertise over this last couple of years. And I know I speak, or a couple of months, sorry. And I know that uh, everyone will uh, be an expert by now. There are over 700 of you joining us today from a host of different countries and exciting brands such as Nissan North America, Colgate Palmolive, Expedia, Verizon, and the list really does go on and on. I won't go through all 700, don't worry. Um, but it's really exciting to have all of you join us today. Um, and as such, please do let us know using the chat function that you should see at the bottom of your screens if you have any questions that you'd like to pose to today's panel or even feedback or opinions as we go. We welcome all of your interaction and we'll be sure to incorporate this throughout the webinar. And finally, today's webinar will be recorded. So if you want to revisit any bits from today's discussion, please do keep an eye out for that in your inboxes over the next couple of days. Um, but that's enough from me. I'll hand over to you, Nicholas, and why don't you take us away? Thanks, Scott. Uh, appreciate it. Good to be back with you all again. And uh, let's jump right in and talk about some of this awesome, I'll just call it mobile stuff. And uh, Matt, I want to start with you because it's it seems very fascinating. You're in the insurance industry and in insurance work. I, when I think of insurance and making claims and, and uh, opening policies, insurance work does not, I think, uh, especially claims, lend itself to um, to bots and mobile and, and AI and stuff. What do you, what do you think it is? How it is? How is it that Metro Mile has been able to to bridge that gap for customers, make them comfortable, you know, make them feel comfortable, leveraging your platform and frankly using your business model. Definitely, yeah. So first, a little background on Metro Mile. So we're the leading digital insurance platform uh, in the U.S., and we offer pay-per-mile insurance. So you basically pay for the miles you drive uh, in a small base rate, and, and that's how we save our customers substantially uh, on their auto insurance. And we're a data science-driven company um, that drives real-time personalized insurance, and we, we definitely pride ourselves on our exceptional user experience. Um, I think that... Um, you know, what we do to kind of bridge that gap and kind of mention that, you know, claims, when you think of them, they are complex. Um, there's some manual processes there. There's a back and forth. Um, traditionally, people might think that, you know, you go, you get in an accident, you're gonna have to call a number, talk to someone. Um, there'll be a few of those phone calls, maybe some emails exchanged. 
uh, and whatnot. And I think to really bridge that gap, what we've really leaned into is building up trust and also just educating and onboarding our customers. And I think that um, building trust starts at the, at the beginning of that customer's journey. So for instance, the majority of our customers actually sign up online. And that's kind of their first experience about Metro Mile and what the product offers. And we need to make sure that that online sign up experience builds that trust initially. So it has to be seamless, has to be a great user experience. It's really that first preview of what the rest of the product is. And if we can get our customers to realize how great the online sign up experience is, you know, then that just kind of leads into how well the uh, claimed experience should ultimately be. And so all the other parts of your app experience and just your customer experience in general contribute to that. And if you're not building up that trust constantly, um, when the time comes for us, uh, which kind of the moment of truth for us is when someone does have a claim, you know, we need to be there for them and they need to trust that. So building up trust is one thing. <clears throat> the second is really onboarding and education. After our customers sign up, we want to get the app in their hands as fast as possible. Many do sign up through the app. So, you know, we check the box there. Um, but we, we try to educate on the benefits of the app. And then once you do get the app, open it, sign in, um, we're educating you about the various features so that when the time comes, you know about claims. You've seen some of the onboarding. And so hopefully we've built up enough trust um, and educated you enough so that if you do unfortunately get into a, uh, an accident and have to file a claim, um, my hope is that you do reach for your phone, but instead of dialing a phone number, you're going to go open up the Metro Mile app and tap the file a claim button. And, and that's where really, you know, once we've done that, um, we've enabled the end customer to be empowered to kind of manage the claim on their own. And I think that that empowerment and that ability to um, manage the claim on their own uh, at their own speed uh, is very important. And that's where Ava comes in. And Ava is our AI claim assistant. Uh, it is how we automate the claim process from end to end. And she's capable of automating um, the whole claim or various parts of it. So she takes the user from uh, claim intake. So defining what happened at the accident scene, taking photos of the damage um, of the vehicle, other parties, et cetera, to guiding the user on the remaining steps which most of the time this would have been, again, that kind of more manual back and forth, multiple touch points. And she's able to help a user find a repair shop, rent a car, uh, take any supplementary uh, photos of the damage. All of this is done via the Metro Mile app um, through a set of guided experiences. It's not a bot per se, it's more just kind of a guided, um, a guided uh, uh, self-serve walkthrough um, of what the user needs to accomplish. And I think that's, that's really important because you're, you're enabling the, the, the customer to, to really be in control there. And, and that's what we continue to evolve. Um, and again, it just goes back to just building up that trust up front and educating. Yeah, I, I suppose, Matt, a lot of it has to do, and you seem to allude to this, to, you know, if you start mobile, if the whole experience begins with mobile, then you can end it in mobile too, right? It's rather rather than having to shift somebody from a channel to a channel, considering you'd start your relationship, if you will, with Metro Mile in mobile in the first place. And then as you say, that building of that trust, I suppose, comes from, all right, well, signing up was easy. Oh, okay, I guess getting my car information in there was easy. Getting my driver's license information in there was easy. And then that's how you're building just those little bits and pieces that you used to have to do on the phone if you do that on the app, right? Exactly, yep. Yeah, awesome. Sarah Feldman, fellow Denverite. I can almost see your house from here, right? <laughs> you're yeah. over, over there visible. Y'all are kind of centered around mobile first, right? Tell us, what, what are your thoughts on what Matt was just sharing when it comes to that? Yeah, I love what Matt shared about building trust, because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing for our businesses, right? We are nothing without our customers, and we're not going to have customers unless they trust us. And so Visible is, is kind of similar. We are an all digital wireless carrier. We don't have stores. We don't have a 1-800 number. And so it's really important that we get it right when our members do begin that journey with us. And I agree um, that you know, it starts the beginning. And I think that, you know, in terms of these guided experiences and, and leveraging AI, I think that trust is a key component, but 
Something I've also noticed is that consumers in general are getting more comfortable with those guided experiences or bots or automation. It's very commonplace today, right? You see it all over e-commerce and retail. I've seen it in the insurance space too, and it's evolved. And that's the good news. I think that there's a time where, you know, that kind of technology got a bad rap because it wasn't great, right? It's yeah. very complicated technology, but luckily it's evolved so much that I think people are beginning to grow more comfortable with it as a resource. Ultimately, it is fast, right? You don't have to do the back and forth, like Matt said, you don't have to do whole time or anything like that. Um, so, so it's gotten better. And I think that what makes members more comfortable too is giving them an out if they need it, right? So you don't want to trap them in an experience where they can't get to a live agent um, when they really want one. And so what we try to be really intentional about is with every element of our, our support, we always make it easy and clear to find where they can connect with an agent. So the Help Center article, if it's you know our, our guided experience as well, we make it easy to connect to an agent if it's just not working. And I think that really helps um, with the comfort level and eliminate some of the, the friction I think we've historically seen from customers in that channel. Yeah, having that net, I'm sure helps. And Sarah, I know we want to talk about that in a little bit as well, especially as it pertains to visible. Uh, Janice, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, Help Shift is there to tie in the information and the infrastructure of your, of your clients and, and make that more actionable and useful. Um, tell us about how that helps build that, that trust out as well. Yeah, yeah. So I would love to build on what Matt and Sarah are talking about. And it's uh, it's interesting for us at HelpShift because uh, our technology uh, plays a huge role, adds value for both the person who owns the product, the, the mobile product, the mobile app, or the mobile game, as well as the person who's running customer support or customer service. Uh, so it's kind of the intersection of both in terms of what customer experience objective do you both have? And you both said it starts with building trust. Uh, and when a user has issues, the first thing you want to do is give them that feeling that you value their time uh, and you are there for them. Uh, and you want to do it where they are, which is inside the app. What you don't want to do is send them away. So send them to Google to go find the, the right answer to their problem. Send them to the web, uh, send them into a browser even, right? Because the minute they leave your experience, you've broken that engagement mm. and it's hard to get them back. So part of building trust is maintaining their engagement, but also responding to them in a way that respects their time. And the thing about mobile users as all of us are, is that we don't like to sit and wait. <laughs> we, we like to multitask. Uh, so the role of, I would say the, the, the first part of respecting a user's time uh, in a mobile app is the asynchronous nature in which they like to communicate. And most of us are you know, text-based. Uh, we don't wanna wait uh, if we have to wait. Um, and so we want to go about doing whatever we were doing and then come back when there's a response. Uh, bots eliminate that wait time, right? Um, and bots don't have to be seen as trying to obscure agents, humans from interacting with your users. Bots are seen as a way of speeding up their time to resolution. <laughs> if you do it in a way that where bots and humans are complementary, Bots can actually speed up the time it takes to even collect information. So what is your username? What is your problem? What device are you on? The beauty of all of that is inside the mobile app, you don't even have to ask any of those questions. Yeah. You know who they are. Yep. You know what device they're on. So then you can get right to what exactly is the issue that you're having so that you can respond fast with a bot or with a human or with both. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's such a great point, Janice, because one of the things, one of my mantras is you never ask a customer the question you should already have the answer to. Right. And that's the beauty of having that, that mobile device, that app, that, you know, that type of interaction with, with your customers. I want to bring Paul into here because uh, Paul at Wealthsimple, um, your entire business model was built around 
mobile. I mean, it started, it, it exists within mobile. And um, while a lot of, especially in, in you know, in, in wealth management and, and, and banking and finance and so forth, a lot of your competitors, a lot of people within that, that, uh, that industry didn't start a mobile and they started to add mobile to it. Right. And so we, you, you described this the other day as we were talking and said you had to learn in the opposite direction. Right. <laughs> you started with mobile and you want to also be able to meet your customers where they are. Right. Because that's kind of a mantra as well. Um, tell us a little bit about how how you did and how you currently are still working and better understanding and better implementing those other channels moving from mobile toward, uh, you know, those more more human type interactions. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting, this conversation. I was just listening to everyone because we did start mobile. And also because we are in, we're a financial services company, there is nothing people find more personal and more trust around your own money, right? So that's like, if you're giving me your money, I better trust you from day one and the experience better represent that. And so where we took advantage of it was in mobile, we actually have different apps for different things. Like we have a trading app, we have a wealth management app, and it allows us to build a very simplified a uh, very robust and reliable experience for that first time user. So things just work. Um, and that's been incredibly successful for us so much so that, you know, yes, there's support we need to do around those experiences and provide access to agents. But really our focus has been how can we make it work 99.9% .9 of the time because again, it's your money, right? Um, but as we've started to grow and now we're over 1.5 million clients, there's been a lot more pressure and people who own multiple products use a desktop version. And so all of a sudden we're in this scenario where we're saying, wait a second, I have to integrate a trading app into a wealth management app. Those are different paradigms. People don't yeah. log in your, your, your investment app every day, but you log into a trading app every day. And so it's now created some additional complexity that we need to really support that mobile experience uh, within sort of that one big umbrella of well simple. And so we're investing in the many of the channels that the people talk about today. You know, we have we have an omni-channel approach to to our support, and we feel that chat and chat bots, for example, absolutely is going to be a huge, huge way for us to scale that and support that experience. And I would say, having both built a chat company back in 2000, I know it's scary to hear that number, to now the advancement of technology around machine learning and AI has made these things actually work really well, especially for those light interactions where the, I mean, you don't wanna be in a 40 minute whole time to find an answer one question. Yeah. It can be done simply at scale. It's, it's a phenomenal experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to, um, naturally, I think I want to go right to Matt now with the same sort of question, Matt, you know, Metro mile also kind of, kind of a similar model there. What are your thoughts on that kind of like learning backwards type of a thing? You, you'd alluded to it a little bit before there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think with with um, respect to how our AI system, Ava, and how she's able to um, just take in those inputs, there are moments where, of course, um, you know, we need to kind of be there for when the customer uh, needs a little more help or guidance or to unblock them. Or maybe they missed an email, missed a notification. Maybe they're just overly busy. Maybe they forgot. But we want to make sure that we're doing right by them and, and, and keeping their claim moving along. So we do have a set of um, uh, learnings from when we first launched Ava that enabled us to evolve her and um, create different kind of pathways and permutations that she can kind of solve the customer's problem. And one of those sometimes is uh, let's go back and, and hand this off to one of our uh, excellent claim adjusters, uh, allow them to kind of unstick whatever's sticking, get them back on track. And then the beauty of that is after they've kind of gone and done that, they can they can go and give that back to to Ava. And so it's not it's not always going to simply be force the user down this this digital channel um, and make them use it. You need to have some level of backstop or way in which they can kind of get get unstuck, really. Yeah, I guess again, it's it's that meeting your customers where they are, and then also it's 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 an appreciation that it isn't simply this or that channel. Is that it's a seamless. Uh, type of an experience, right? Where when I talk to a brand, when I, if I'm on my app with Metro Mile, if I'm on my app with, with, uh, with any of your brands, I want to be able to know 
that all that information is being shared. Janice, we talk about help shift and the work that you're doing there. We talk about how that customer support interaction is such a is such a wealth of information, but so often it'll just fall right into the silo for you know wherever it came in from. And you and you have a problem a lot of times. A lot of organizations have problems sharing that information and getting that closed loop from what your feedback is from your customers. Um, tell us a little bit more about your thoughts and how how do, how does it uh, what would you recommend to keep people from losing that insight making sure that it's shared across the entire enterprise yeah we've seen um, because we you know we sit right in the middle of customer service and product managers um, we've seen good practices and we've seen no practices <laughs> so no practices typically is you know all of the the issues that users typically face um, they're certainly tracked by uh, cs teams um, and, uh, you know, they maybe get reported on in terms of, well, how many issues were related to bugs in the product or bugs in the app? Um, how many issues were, were sort of related to, I had a problem with my account. Uh, I'm, you know, mad about something, you know, something's glitching, a technical problem. Um, but oftentimes, you know, we see people product teams not really double clicking into truly understanding the, the real issue, where the issues occur. So it's not the fact that in general, they're not happy with your app or they're having a problem with your app, but where exactly in your app is it happening? Because that will inform, you know, as a product leader myself, it informs uh, me of a couple of things. One is, um, am I designing the right experience? Because if my problem as a user, uh, for example, is I just can't find where to go. <laughs> and so I think it's broken. I think there's something wrong with the app or the product and I just can't find the information. Um, that's, that's a design issue, Yeah. right? Or if truly there is a bug and you know, we've seen uh, a lot of a lot of companies in the rush to publish or update their apps in the app store, you know, quite frankly, some of them use their customers or their users as testers. Uh, sure. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, how that shows up is the the number of issues that go unresolved, especially right after an app update or an app gets published. If you look at the volume of issues go up. Those issues go unresolved because they are bug related, which cannot be resolved by a CS team immediately. Right, yeah. It actually takes months and months to, to resolve some of these issues. And so that impacts the user and whether they actually continue to use the app or whether they come back, whether they continue to subscribe or not subscribe. Um, and it impacts the CSAT scores. Sure. So I think that's where you know the close partnering between the two teams to really look at the data can help you not just improve the product and the experience in the product, but the overall customer experience of, you know, in general for your users. Yeah. yeah you know, Sarah, I see you nodding along there and uh, I have a specific question for you about that customer feedback, but I want to hold, I want, I want to come back to you in a second with that, but I, but I want to hear, what are your thoughts on that? You're sharing between the different parts and different silos, if you will, of your organization, right? When someone has an experience and someone has, uh, has, you know, hits a hiccup of some sort, it's being shared around, right? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I a lot of what Janice was sharing and we've really evolved our processes in terms of what that feedback loop looks like between care and product. And I think we've evolved to a place where we're, we're, we're pretty good um, and we've you know eliminated some of the gaps that we were running into. And what we've done is we've created a system to where our agents are actually submitting defects and tickets that they're coming across from our members when they're interacting with them at, and those go directly into JIRA. And we have actually assigned one person to be what we call our voice of the member lead. This person is solely dedicated to making sure that that data that we're seeing really makes it across to product because that was our number one gap we had to solve, right? There's so much data to look at. How do you make sure that these issues that we're running across really make it to the top of the list? And so by putting that person in that position, that's really helped bridge the gap between our two groups. 
to help with the communication because that's what it's all about, right? It's yeah. just about communication. Yeah. And we've taken a few other best practices and, you know, we are really lucky in that all of our customer data is coming through chat, right? We don't have stores. Our agents are the only ones who are really talking to our members at all from visible. And so it is just a treasure trove of data. So it can be overwhelming. But what we've done too is beyond that that ticketing process, um, which actually gives the agents to a lot of ownership around those issues and um, really feels empowering for them. What we've done is we've empowered the product team to pull their own data, right? They don't have to rely on us. They don't have to rely on an analyst. Let's teach them how to get in there and pull the data that they're looking for so that if we can't help them for whatever reason, their requests don't bottleneck with us. And that way we can always quantify issue and that's that's the end of the game is how big is the issue how often is it happening and so we want to make sure that they have direct access to that data and that's something we've done which has really really helped um and beyond that we just have regular reviews of member facing issues as well as mm -hmm. agent facing issues you have to keep talking because otherwise you can have a conversation you move on then you forget about it right you have to have that consistent dialogue yeah, yeah. Problems, problems can be fixed and problems go away, but there is always another trove of them to be found, right? Um, Paul, you're nodding along. What are you? you know, what's what's been the experience there, um, where uh, you know where you're sharing that information and you're actually putting it to work as well? You know, it, it's so interesting because like there's this there's this a book written by Chip and Dan Heath called Switch. Like, how do you make change happen? And everyone wants to do and improve the customer experience, right? everywhere in the company wants to. And it's like, how do you help give them more empathy so they're closer to the client experience? And so there's two things that have happened recently that are both interesting that I've, you know, aside from all the, the metrics and the case drivers and the reports and all the stuff you do and the roadmap that you build out, um, we had an, a massive surge around uh, March uh, because of the pandemic of actually increased trading volume in our app, so much so that we fell way behind on the backlog of tickets. And we actually held what's called a ticket party and where people from every aspect of the company came in and started handling tickets. I'm talking about portfolio managers who usually give financial plans through to the developers and engineers and operations people. And although everyone knew about some of these challenges, actually solving and, and, and engaging a client in a ticket really brought them right close to it, right close to the, how that client's feeling, what's going on. And it was actually pro probably one of the most interesting transformations for the company in terms of getting that empathy all the way throughout every role. Uh, now, you can't do that every time, and you certainly don't have a, an emergency situation like that every time. So there are other ways to do that. We are, we are actually uh, right now in the midst of client journey mapping, where we're actually going through some of these client journeys as they flow through both our product and people and then putting real interactions at different critical points it may be a recorded call it may be the actual email response maybe the actual chat and so they're not just hearing us talk about it they're actually listening and seeing the client in their own words you know give the story of that part of the journey and i think that's really important um, and, and making sure that client's voice gets heard all the way throughout the company yeah, I, I I agree, Paul, and and of course, um, I, I was I was just talking with my friend Dan Gingus the other day on on Twitter about he's what he likes to say, and I told I promised him I was going to steal this line from him. He says, "Feedback without action is like a day without sunshine," and so naturally, this is all going to fall to Matt. Matt Metromile, you are the big shot for product over there, <laughs> so we're all going to gang up on you, right? I, are, you guys are leveraging that, right? You're taking the feedback. You're not just solving that problem immediately, but you're taking it in a more holistic and an enterprise sense and saying, here's what we need to fix about what we're doing as well, right? Definitely, yeah. And so I also manage our, our product design team. And so I think everything that, that Paul said around just building empathy and getting that across the organization is just so core to some of the things that we've done in the past and that we continue to do. Um, we have a consumer journey, uh, much like the uh, client journey that, that Paul mentioned, that is kind of a um, unifying uh, uh, framework, if you will, to kind of get the whole company to understand what our customer's journey really is from when they realize that you know, we exist and we offer this product to when they renew with us uh, down the line. And so it's actually a tool that we use that um, everyone goes through like in their uh, new hire uh, orientation actually. And I think um, we've done other things that just create, that, that enable everyone to have a, a voice in what that customer experience is. 
one of our most active uh, Slack channels, for instance, it's called Voice of the Customer. Anyone can post there. They can post something that they heard on the street from someone they ran into who knew about Metro Mile. Um, it can be something that was emailed in via some app feedback. It could come from our amazing customer experience team. And so that kind of builds up um, empathy in it and it creates conversations around things, right? Yeah. And so, yes, at the end of the day, there, there is the job of taking all of that feedback and coalescing it into actually acting on it. And you know, that's definitely one of the main challenges of how do you prioritize? And I think that's where we get a good mix of the qualitative and the quantitative, um, the product team and the customer experience team uh, they meet once a month in what we call kind of a consumer journey and CX team kind of sync and they share. And there are times where we're hearing the same stuff uh, and, and we want that. We want to know what, what those continuous issues are. Um, we want to know what should like bubble up um, on the priority list. Um, but then there's the data side. There's, there's trying to navigate through just all these different inputs that you have and how do you kind of see the forest for the trees for that, right? Um, so, uh, we do have to kind of hunker down sometimes, um, and, uh, our amazing, uh, user researcher, she will guide us through kind of going through our NPS surveys, um, and really, you know, taking the time to dig in, uh, ensuring everyone gets a chance to like actually read those comments. Don't just look at the number, uh, but actually you read through the granular information to try to really paint a picture of, okay, where, where are the problems? Where are, where are the hotspots right now? And so it's, it's all of that um, kind of that ultimately has to get, get combined and looked at and prioritized and, and added to a roadmap eventually. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you can collect all this data, but one of the things that helps turn it into that action is that empathy, right? I mean, that's kind of, kind of helps provide the spark. Janice, you're nodding along your big smile there. What, what would you like to add to that as well? Yeah. About empathy. Yeah, I could talk about this forever. And in fact, um, <laughs> You know, I was I had a meeting with our product designers and our product managers last night, and we literally walked through a uh, an issue, a conversation that uh, a user was having with one of our big customers, one of our biggest gaming customers, and we followed the thread, and it started with, you know, a user whose account was deleted accidentally by his dad. So this is a this is a player, right? Sure, likely story, Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, of course, he he sounded like he was a minor. Uh, he didn't have all the information, and there were chat bots deployed to collect that information. What is your username? Uh, well, what platform? Or sorry, what what game were you playing? This that, and the other. He answered all the questions, but it got to a, a point where he couldn't answer the question because his dad had the information and he didn't. Uh, and so the, the issue was closed, which was, uh, we're gonna resolve this issue until you can come back with the information. <laughs> and so we follow this thread and, and then he, the, the user returns a day later and, and tries to ask the same set of questions because you know, he was like, well, maybe let, let me ask a different question. Um, and so he attempts this three times and this happens over the course of three days. And over that entire exchange, you see multiple bots stepping in mm -hmm. um, and, and then finally you see a human. And if you observe the, the way that, that each bot messaged back or responded, and then you look at the human, there were four different voices speaking to the same user. And you could even tell in the words that they were using. And that's just an example of, you know, if you truly want to create that experience, first empathize with them, but also show them that you've got empathy by speaking to them as if you are one person, <laughs> not as if you are four people or three bots yeah. and one And person. a bot or two, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, by, by spending time looking at those conversations, you know, and, and when we were looking at that string, one of our designers even marked, how's the user feeling with each mm. response? Very good, yeah. <laughs> happy faces, the, you know, the question marks, the frustration and other expletives that are, are probably <laughs> in his mind at the time. But, you know, understanding how visceral, like taking a, a very visceral view of what the user is thinking and feeling with each response allows you to, 
deploy chatbots in, a, in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and the language that they use matters. Yeah. So if we've got you know, an experience where, you know, Matt, in your case, if, if Ava is interacting with a user, guiding them through how to fill out an insurance claim, for example, or Sarah, you know, on the support side, uh, I think the lesson here is, do your bots sound the same, <laughs> right? Because it's one, it's the same user, but now they've got different experiences within your product or service. Um, and then, then comes the human. So it's connecting those three together into one conversation, one tone, one voice. That's how you reflect empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that, that's such a good, like, it's, it's kind of like an overall end to end enterprise thing that you need to keep in mind is how are you integrating the AI, the, the bots, the, the automated, you know, the, the machine learning and all of those tinkerings with, with people as well. And Sarah, I, I see you nodding. We spoke a, a little bit earlier with, with Matt and with Paul, both about their, you know, their, uh, mobile centricity. And one of the things that's so curious about visible and you had, you'd alluded to this before, and I think it kind of ties in what Janice was just saying about that, that interaction between the machine and the, and the human, you don't have an 800 number <laughs> and, but you're a telephone company, <laughs> but it, that was based on go to market. You did that deliberately because you looked at what you believed your customers wanted, but you didn't just rest on your laurels. You didn't just say, oh, and so that's how it is. You continued to learn. You showed, I wouldn't necessarily call it humility, but curiosity and finding out how it is to best service your customers. And you have an experience and you have something to share about how there's, there's the, the desire for the human interaction. Tell us a little bit about how Visible went, you know, approach that and how they went about you know, improving even more. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you said our story you know, exactly the way it happened. We had a bunch of Verizon vets who had been in the industry for 20, 30 years, and they came together and said, you know what, we think we can do something different and better for a different group of customers. Let's turn the industry on its head and let's take away all the unnecessary stuff that people don't want. And something we know from our experience is people don't like going to the store and waiting in line, um, hoping to get to someone, you know, it, taking out the time in their day. And they don't like dialing a 1-800 number and waiting in the IBR to get connected to an agent, right? How many times have we all done that? Completely stuck um, while we're waiting for that help. And I think Janice said it earlier, you know, our customers, they want convenience. They want simplicity. They don't have the time to do these kinds of things. So we said, all right, no 1-800 number, right? We knew this was a, a really bold move going into the telco space and not giving people that line to talk to us directly and providing all of our support digitally. So we launched with web, um, web chat, app chat, SMS, and social. And, you know, we, we had this idea of who our customers were going to be going into launching Visible. And what we found over time as we grew was that, yes, we captured that subset of customers, but our customer base is actually even broader than that. So they are very digitally focused, but we have some other folks who, you know, might want to talk to someone at some point in time. So we looked at all the feedback coming through. We looked at chats. We said, is anyone asking about this, right? Did, did we nail it? And what we found is by and large, yes, we nailed it. But there are some members who sometimes need that phone call. So instead of setting up a 1-800 number, you know, getting voice agents on the floor, doing everything to send that up, we said, well, I don't think we need to, we have to meet those needs by doing that. Let's look at doing it a different way. And so what we've done is we've equipped all of our agents with a soft phone so that if someone chats in and they're struggling, if they're not very technically savvy, um, or if we just notice, hey, this person has repeated a lot, and I think a phone call would really help them right now, we'll offer to make that phone call. So there is that net if people want it. Now, it's not used that often, but some people also want to talk to a supervisor, and if you want to talk to a supervisor, we can make that happen too. So we have grown that channel, but it's not one where the members can contact us that way, right? They're still coming in the digital channel. They still appreciate having that convenience and simplicity to initially reach out to us, but we can take it another level, right? And another initiative that we recently launched is something that we call Blue Love. And if you go to the Visible website, you'll see we love our Klein Blue. That is our color. 
So we actually set up a team of agents who um, will look at customers who are coming over to visible from another carrier. And if there's an issue in that number transfer, we'll pick up the phone and call those people. So we're using it as another channel to actually prevent the contact from coming in in the first place, proactively reaching out to fix it before a member even knows that they have an issue. So we're gonna to continue to evolve that channel, but we don't see ourselves launching a 1-800 number anytime soon. Um, what we're doing is really meeting our customers' needs and we'll keep listening to see if that needs to change. Yeah, and Sarah, great great example of using data and information that you already have to to proactively reach out. I wanna shift gears just a little bit and, and uh, address a question that came in in the Q&A box, Nicholas, which is such an awesome name. He asked, um, and, and I'm gonna kind of sum it up here and I wanna hear what Matt and Paul especially have to say about this. You were talking about mobile and mobile connectivity is, I mean, it's not so much a problem as it used to be, but certainly in certain places of the country, you get a dropped call or, oh, my battery is dying and I'm in the middle of an interaction or I go through a tunnel or, you know, maybe I'm up here skiing and I need to call in or something like that. How are you all um, addressing the connectivity when it comes to, I got down the road a little bit with an interaction, either with a bot or maybe on the, lo- on the line with somebody, how do you tie that in so that when that's picked up again, when after I do charge my phone, after my Bluetooth comes back on, or after I, I get back into where I can get Wi-Fi again, how are you and, and what are you putting in place to kind of address those sorts of continuity issues for that, that, that better experience? Matt, let's start with you. Or at least, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, maybe maybe you are, maybe you aren't working on that yet. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in general, like um, depending on what the scenario is or what the what the interaction is, uh, you want to you want to provide the user with a way to uh, resume whatever they were doing and and as like graceful and elegant a way as possible. So, if they're getting their quote and for some reason they get you know bad service uh, and it 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 kind of airs out. How do you get them back on that path they were on? How do you get them to that happy state again? So, you know, we do things to ensure that the user has the ability to quickly pick up where they, where they left off. Um, from a customer experience standpoint, I think you know if um, someone's on like a digital chat or even even um, just on a phone call, again, it's about having having the right systems in place to ensure that when that when you do reconnect with that customer, you're not going to be rehashing everything that you've just gone through. Like why go and down that path again? So yeah. I think ensuring that our, our, our agents in our systems can, can basically support that and recover elegantly is, is probably probably the, the, what I would focus on. And, I, and I, yeah, and I suppose, Matt, that with, with insurance and auto insurance, it's kind of a, a fractured type of an engagement anyway, right? I'm going to give you some information. I got to go look for the other information anyway, necessarily, right? And so there's, there's, I've got a ticket, I've got a case open, something like that. And, and you're, you're stitching all of it along together, right? I mean, we try to streamline that as much yeah. as possible. So in, in many ways, uh, um, you know, we, we try to ask for the necessary information and then we can go and and hopefully fill in the rest on, uh, mm-hmm. on our own. Um, and, but yes, in, in certain cases uh, uh, that could happen, but we try to mitigate any potential back and forth or need to stop the flow and then go get something and then resume the flow. We try to find creative ways to enable the, the customer to, to not have to do that actually. Sure. And Paul, over over there, wealth simple. Your interactions are going to be a little probably more immediate in the moment, right? With trades and these sorts of things going on. So, how is it that you or are you uh, considering how you're addressing these sorts of continuity issues? When when yeah, and, it, and, and we have a kind of both ends of the spectrum. We have people maybe checking once a year, and people who like do do use the application all day. And and so it just depends on the type of client. I think I think. You know, we were since since our industry is regulated and there's a lot of compliance. You know, from the very beginning, we had to actually build a holistic view of the client, like you know exactly who they are, all the identities, all the things that they're doing, and it's it's, it's so it's born from that regulation to begin with. That sort of DNA of like one view of the customer, and so as we started to launch these new products and have different interactions and have scenarios potentially where connectivity dropped off or the customer just for some reason stops talking or moves on to something else, right? Um, we actually have built fairly strict SLAs around follow-up and updates, um, and in a completely virtual, uh, you know, client success uh, system, uh, agents are empowered to actually, if an SLA is going to breach, to go to a ticket that's not even owned by them, to go and do a follow-up, see the full history, understand the full client profile, and then jump right in in stream. 
Um, not saying it's a perfect model because they're not going to be as uh, armed with everything that the original CSA has, has had. But the idea is we're going to be the proactive one to go back out and make sure we connect no matter what, whether that client gets back to us or not, because something was happening midstream. Yeah, you've got something open and already in action, right? You don't want to just leave it sitting out there. Yeah. Yeah. I you would know, say almost sometimes we're a little too tight on update SLAs. It's like, that's a big focus for us. It's like, oh, I can see it. I can see it as, as the pinging starts happening. This one's going to breach. Who's getting at it? And they jump on it. And sometimes like maybe it, we can we can start, start focusing on the whole picture a little more as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get back to that regulation stuff in just a second, Paul. I want to come come back to that. But Sarah, you you are nodding along there as well. Uh, when, when we're talking about that connectivity, surely visible never has problems with dropped calls or anything like that. But uh, tell us what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it's pretty ironic, right? We're in the telco space. And when people have a problem, um, you know, oftentimes it's a problem with their service, right? Yeah. They can't call, they can't text, they don't have data. So then they're reaching out to us on a digital channel and how good is that really when they're having service issues? So we have a, a few ways that we account for that and um, very similar to what Paul was talking about, right? We do have what we call a graceful reconnect feature where if someone is disconnected from a chat and they come back in without a certain amount of time, they will be reconnected to that agent. Um, the problem happens when that agent is not available or they don't meet those certain time thresholds. So, you know, very similarly, we, we make sure we document what's great about chats is we just copy paste what happened, right? Like the whole interaction is there. You don't have to take time and synthesize the call. You know, you can put the notes there. So that makes it really easy for the next agent to pick up that case and start where they left off because they can literally see where they left off in the conversation yeah. and what troubleshooting they've already done. Um, beyond that, if it's appropriate, we'll make an outbound call with our soft phones. Um, if that, that would work, just to follow up and let them know, hey, we're here, let's keep going. Um, and then also something really helpful is we have social and that's an asynchronous channel. And so you don't have to you know, be live with that agent where you need help. And we find that's where a lot of our, our network volume will go. People will go to social because they don't have to be there in a synchronous conversation. They can provide the updates as they can so that we can resolve it that way. So we have a few different approaches to that. Sure. Yeah. You know, Sarah, what, as, as you're speaking, Janice, I'm going to bring you into this because I remember um, earlier you're speaking very passionately about empathy. And it seems to me that there's a way to leverage this, this connectivity and bringing the data together and, you know, one ticket, one customer, everything is out there, no matter what the channel, no matter within a channel, what agent it is that's, that's helping a customer, all that information is there. And doesn't that add to that empathy being able to, to to share with the customer, no, we know what you went through already. We know where you are, so that the customer doesn't have to again explain where they're going. And 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 uh, you know, Matt and Paul both mentioning this as well. Sarah, you were talking about it. Janice, don't you think that's really a key of of showing that empathy is being able to bring all that information together, so the customer doesn't have to go through it again. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, I would say it's not just bringing the information together on behalf of the user and the issue that they're currently facing, but it's on behalf of all users who face the same issue. Uh, and, and I think that's where the power of, you know, I saw a question in the in the panel um, about AI and ML. Um, one of the best ways that we've been able to deploy that to demonstrate empathy and, uh, you know, get better at understanding their intent because that's a part of empathy, right? It's like understanding yeah. their point of view. What is their intent when they express a problem? Uh, and what, what gets you really accurate at understanding their intent, regardless of the phrases they, that they use? And, and then by the way, add into that the multiple languages that come in, right? So if you've got an app uh, and you're servicing users from every country in the world, you know, it's such as our gaming customers, um, to get the best out of all of that knowledge, uh, you have to be able to process all those languages and then turn them into intent classifications so that you know one phrase spoken in Korean is similar to another phrase spoken in English, similar to another phrase spoken in Russian. Uh, and they tend to all have the same characteristics and, and the resolutions look similar and the steps to, you know, to respond look similar. And so in order for you to deliver on 
the empathy and get more accurate at understanding the user's intent and also understand what's the best path to resolution, you have to have a lot of data <laughs> at your disposal. Um, and it's not, just like I said, it's not just the user's data in the moment in the issue, but it's across all the users because you know, what we've seen is agents who try to sort of decipher what the user's intent is, you know, when they type in words like WTF, <laughs> what, you know, what, what does that mean? And, and agents are only 80% accurate at their best, at their best, which means one out of five times they get the issue wrong. And then, so they send the user down the wrong path or they respond in the wrong way, whereas machines are way better and can get more accurate and can process multiple languages. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, I'll go to sort of how do, how do you respond with empathy? The advantage that bots have over humans is that bots can speak multiple languages. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. 180 of them. <laughs> Whereas yeah. agents, can't. so if you don't have agents that speak all those languages, then you're not able to return, you know, the, the conversation that your user is trying to have with you. And that goes, that adds to the empathy, the feeling of empathy that you want to convey. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's kind of turns it on its head. It's not, it's not just this cold hearted, you know, steel machine of your AI and your bots. It's using that power and, and the analysis to actually in, in, enhance you know, that empathetic uh, interaction that you're having with your customers. Um, we're running up close to the top of the hour here, but I did want to get back, Paul, we were, we were talking a little bit ago, um, kind of shifting, shifting gears back again in, into the regulation of your industry. And one of the things that, that I like to harp on is certain industries and I use healthcare all the time as a great example of this. Certain industries will lean on regulations and requirements as an excuse to not be customer centric. And it's such a shame sometimes. Yours is an industry that's highly regulated. Uh, investments and money and finance and all that stuff that's way over my head. Uh, but y'all at Well Simple didn't see it as a hindrance. You actually look at some of those things as an opportunity to better help your customers and drive that better empathetic relationship. Tell us, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, you know, we're, we're an industry that needs some uh, innovation and reimagination, right? The, we, like the experience isn't always great. And it's also intimidating, especially if you talk about wealth management. And, and you know, one of our goals is to provide, provide financial freedom to everybody, not just people who can afford it. And, and so to do that, we have to have an ex experience that it doesn't feel intimidating. And so, yeah, when we have a scenario where certain questions can't be answered unless you're a licensed professional, right? And that's what happens uh, in, in, our, in our world. We had to very early on start thinking about ways where that transition can be seamless. And you know what's really interesting, what's born out of that is a couple of, of interesting initiatives and ideas. One is that today in, I have a portfolio management team who like you know provide plans, give advice, financial advice, and I have a client success team. But they very early on started doing this cross training initiative. So we have these Tuesday homework sessions where CS people and PM show up, and they actually give uh, CS people um, some homework to take away to learn more about how to give structure to those conversations still not violate compliance by giving them securities advice, but, but make that transition really softer landing in their hands. And as a result, what we started to see is that there's some CS people who've actually on their own gone out and started to get licensed. They're starting to take the <laughs> process to actually become. So now we're seeing this bridge form and career path that I wasn't even expect to see between a team traditionally that doesn't necessarily go to become an investment professional, but now they're starting to move that way. And so now we now, the third part of this is that because of that, we've actually developed an initiative to provide a digital vice bridge. So we feel like, like besides talking to a CS member on, or actually talking to a PM, there actually is a need to have that same service, but done asynchronously in kind of like a digital advice hub. And we're going to staff that with chat we're gonna put all the assets and all the tools and retirement calculators and things right there so that if you have one or two questions, but you don't wanna take a full blown call with a planner, you now can get that self-serve on your own in a way that fits your time frame. And then yeah, I may eventually you may graduate and wanna to talk to a PM and get a full plan. And so this is, this is something we've definitely tried to anchor on as a differentiator in how we're approaching the market. Um, and we think it's starting to pay off really right now. Yeah, awesome. That's great. What a good example of that. Matt, I'm sure that you got um, some examples of, you know, another highly regulated, maybe not quite as highly regulated, but certainly there are hoops you have to jump through. Um, you're born online, you're born digital. And so tell us a little bit more about how you're turning that into actually an asset for you. 
Yes, I think some of the challenges that we faced in the past that we've, that we've overcome is, is you know, in, in insurance, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of complexity there and things that can, you know, sound like jargon if you don't, don't know about it or if you've never had insurance before, um, even to something as simple as like, what's my deductible mean? Um, and so I think what, what some of that regulation and some of the um, complexity there has forced us to do is really think about the content, think about how it's presented, how can we make this more understandable? This is something that we're constantly evolving. And it, it really does force you to, to, I think, approach the problem a bit differently and, and, and really kind of just get more laser focused on how you can explain some of these um, more harder to understand concepts for sure. Yeah, it's kind of uh, necessity becoming the mother of the invention right there at, at Metro Mile probably, huh? Yeah. All right, cool. So we are getting up, like I said, toward the uh, toward the top of the hour. We're going to wrap up here in a second. But uh, before we do, one of the things that I've been doing over the last several months with all of these Reuters events webinars is finishing off with the same question. And we're going to go around the horn and hit everybody up for this. Uh, 2020 has been such a weird, crazy year. Uh, everything is different, right? Um, but things are soon to get differenter or better or kind of go back maybe to the way that they were. So what I ask everybody as we wrap up these conversations is, and Sarah, I'm going to start with you from Visible. Um, what is it that you think that has changed that is going to endure back when things go almost back to normal that you're actually glad has, has been a change that, you, that you're looking forward to seeing uh, continue going on into the future? Yeah, that's a great question. And I have some pretty easy answers for you. Um, one of the things that's changed over at Visible is we, we have an office space and we're very much, you have to be in Denver to work at Visible. And we are a fully remote team now. We do not have any plans to go back to an office. We are permanently work at home as of October 1st. And, you know, that, that can be a real shocker for a lot of people, right? It's how do you work differently? How do you still maintain those connections? Um, how do you work on, it? how do you deliver mobile service from everyone's home, right? And I, I've been really touched to be part of the process at Visible because we still have our human connections with each other. And we've proved that you can run a phone, phone company from your home. Um, and we still have a really great community, which is one of our core values amongst our employees. And I think that's really hard to do, especially remotely, but we've been, been able to do that. And I think that will continue. And of course, working from home has had a number of benefits for a lot of our employees and um, our, our team actually uh, for us to take visible me time every day, which is an hour or two, go take your time, go hang out with your kids, go out on a walk, do what you can to take care of yourself in this uncharted territory. And it's been great to have that kind of flexibility within this space. So um, I'm really happy to be part of it. That's great, Sarah. Everybody visible working from home, but of course the lucky ones still get to work from Denver. So good for you. Head of customer care at Visible. Thanks, Sarah Feldman. Uh, Paul Tashima, what, are, what is your answer? What do you think is that, that's changed that's good for, for the better? I think that um, at least what I feel we're seeing is that trust can be built digitally more than ever. And, and I sh I'm sure many generations, especially young generations are already doing this, but I think across the board, we're seeing people starting to build digital relationships earlier, uh, both with their clients and with themselves. And I think that the idea is that if you are a business that allows a seamless uh, onboarding digital experience and all the bells and whistles of, of offline and online, I think you're going to win. And I think that's where you got to focus. And I think that's where the new consumer is going uh, in 2021. Awesome. Great. Paul Tashima, thanks. Uh, well Simple's Chief Client Experience Officer from Toronto. Thanks, buddy. Matt Stein, what do you say? Yeah, I hate to be unoriginal, but I think I think Sarah <laughs> and, and, and mine are mostly the same there. I think that just the change to how we work, how we collaborate, um, and just, yeah, it's it's been a, it's been a complete shift. So, um, you know, we're, we're now moving to kind of more of a hybrid form where, you know, we have people working in the office uh, eventually, um, people who can work from home uh, full time, hopefully. And I think that that, that change is, is basically here to stay. And I think that, um, you know, like at a more kind of macro level outside of Metro Mile and, and whatnot, just people's habits, people's driving habits is something that I think we're going to see changing dramatically, uh, changing dramatically too. Um, less people commuting, um, more lower mileage drivers. Um, yeah, yeah. 
in good, Norwalk. good. More and safer drivers. Good. All right. Metro Mile. Matt Stein, the uh, VP of product there. Thanks so much. And finally, wrapping it up, we're going to uh, ask Janice Lee from HelpShift, the uh, chief market and product officer, also from San Francisco out there with Matt. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I actually get to combine all these things because uh, the, the changes we're seeing are on both the consumer or user behavior side and on the employee side, uh, and they're related. So on the consumer side, you know, because for instance, in, in uh, uh, financial services, people can't go to banks anymore. <laughs> they, they can't go to that insurance office to file a claim. So what we're seeing because we're in the app space is this explosion of apps that are being created to solve for these problems, these consumer problems, you know, even health and fitness, meditation, dating. I mean, there's apps exploding everywhere yeah. to, to augment or to maybe substitute, permanently substitute some of the things that we used to do in person. And that's super exciting. And then on the employee side, uh, you know, a help shift has done the same thing, but I want to talk about what's happening with agents and call centers, because as a result of COVID, you know, any agents who can still go into the call center and many can't, you know, they're having to break them out into different shifts now because of social distancing, where yeah. you can only have one third of the capacity of the people in the office at, at any given time. And as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of our customer service teams scale down their agents and deploy more bots. Uh, because, you know, it's better to have a, a bot working around the clock than to have three shifts of agents sure, <laughs> working yeah. around the clock from home. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, you know, in order to take on all of that volume of like these apps exploding, all these users coming online, and then how do you service them? If you're launching a new app, how do you deliver a best experience for your, you know, new prospective subscriber, for example? Yep. So it's like yeah. the best of, of those two changes coming together which I don't think we'll, we will ever return to, you know, consuming financial services the way that we've done before, nor are we going to return to providing services or support the way we've done before. Yeah, definitely a whole new digital world, uh, Janice, and help shift helping their clients help their customers in, in, in the new world. That's great. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Scott, I think that we, I have once again, bowled us right over the top of the hour and gone long so that, uh, if anybody has a meeting at noon, uh, they're late now. <laughs> it's like everyone can blame it on uh, Nicholas if you're late. To yep. your next I'll take it. I'll take it right here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, as Nicholas said, um, that wraps up today's webinar. I know we covered a lot of ground there and we discussed some incredibly important topics. Um, there were certainly some fantastic insights and definitely a number of things that I've written down to incorporate into future events. So uh, I appreciate your insights, guys. Um, I would like to take a brief moment to thank each of our fantastic panelists, Paul, Sarah, Janice, and Matt, for lending us their time and their expertise today. Um, and I'd also like to thank our moderator, Nicholas, as ever, for guiding us through the discussion. Um, finally, I'd like to thank today's sponsors, HelpShift um, and Janice, for working with us to create this hugely successful webinar. Um, if you would like to check out what they have to offer and the things that Janice has talked about today, um, please head over to www.helpshift.com or look out for details attached alongside the recording of today's webinar, which you'll be receiving in the coming days. Last but not least, I'd like to thank each one of you who joined us today, whether you joined us live or whether you'll be listening on demand. Um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained actionable takeaways. Um, we've received a large number of questions um, that we, we didn't manage to get around to all of them. So I appreciate everyone's interaction. Um, we will be gathering those questions together and passing them on to our panelists um, for any, any added input that they want to, to give out. Um, so keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and finally, thank you from all of us at Reuters Events. Um, we do hope to welcome you back soon for the next webinar or workshop. Have a great evening.